Camille, you are up for uh, the next for uh, the final speaker intro. Thank you, Bill. Um, great to be here, everyone, and I really want to thank uh, Dima for presenting today. Um, one of the reasons that I wanted to have him um, make some remarks about the work that he's doing is that it falls within the scope of the Pacific Research Platform which many of you have heard about or helped to build out, in fact, or work on. Um, but Dima and John Graham, who's also on the line, I see are good colleagues from UC San Diego, uh, which has been a very strong and leading partner on the Pacific Research Platform. Um, just a two sentence overview of that. It's a project that's coming into its final year, actually an NSF funded program um, to help expand the capacity for researchers doing work in data intensive science. So uh, particle physics, astronomy, um, visualization, high resolution video and VR kind of applications, genomics, um, any of those that many of you are already working on to try to smooth out not only the network infrastructure by putting the network engineers like Dima and John in touch with their counterparts at universities and research centers all over the country and in fact globally, but also the uh, research IT staff and, and professionals who are growing into this field who can do more of that person to person kind of consultation with the faculty and really be able to diagnose their needs and understand both the hardware and networking infrastructure as well as the science side, um, which I've been happy to help support that work that um, many of you have already forged the way on and are continuing to build out. So Dima, I will just introduce briefly and then turn it over to him. He's an applications developer, as I said, at UC San Diego and the San Diego Supercomputing Center, uh, works on the Comet Supercomputer System Enhancements and CalIT2, which is a, a similar organization to Citrus, one of the uh, institutes for science and innovation throughout the UC system. So he's working at CalIT2 to support and expand the Nautilus uh, global Kubernetes cluster. The development focuses on supporting large scale computations, data visualization, IoT, data storage solutions. Uh, research interests include HPC systems, data storage and access, microservice architectures, performance, man uh, performance measurement and analysis. And I have to say one of the great things that Dima contributed to the PRP is a trace route map. Um, which was really uh, very helpful in being able to visualize the progress of data from one um, geographic point to another. We had all these matrices and such, um, which are all very useful, but uh, being able to pinpoint that, um, that infrastructure on, on a map and visualize it there was also very useful. So I will turn it over to Dima. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Camille. Uh, let me share it. Okay, so I will talk about uh, Nautilus Kubernetes cluster. And uh, for this cloud meeting, I guess I will present uh, alternative to the cloud that we are building ourselves. So this is running on our own infrastructure and uh, we call it potluck supercomputing. So the idea is the same as in potluck, you come with your own hardware or you can come without your own hardware and you get more than what you brought into the cluster. So the project started uh, with PRP's vision of how to tune the high-speed networks across California. Uh, PRP had a bunch of uh, servers uh, called Fiona nodes in uh, UC campuses and some other uh, universities and um, PRP was trying to basically measure the disk to disk and uh, memory to memory performance and make sure that network is uh, producing what it's supposed to do. And you can see a couple super supercomputer center on this map. Um, so the goal was to move from uh, five megabits megabits per second to 50 uh, gigabits per second disk to disk in five years. And now we're in the end of year five and we definitely reached this goal, but also we built something a bunch more than that. Um, at some point, uh, this project was merged with a project called Chase CI. Uh, we got a letter of commitment from 50 researchers from, from 15 campuses and that provided more uh, hardware 
uh, for PRP. Um, so Fiona's, Fiona nodes, uh, there are several kinds of them. Uh, some of them are just uh, pure uh, servers tuned for uh, high-speed uh, networks. Some of them actually uh, have a bunch of hard, uh, hard disks and those are storage Fiona nodes. And some of them are called Fiona 8s and those have eight uh, GPUs. Uh, normally those are gaming GPUs like 1080 Ti or 2080 Ti now. And those can be used for machine learning. And the uh, breakthrough in it was when we switched to Kubernetes. Uh, so that's the secret weapon of uh, Google, as it's called. And we installed, uh, first we just installed Kubernetes to orchestrate uh, Persona. That's the software that is measuring the network performance. And that was super convenient because instead of manually uh, installing it on every single node, we just throw it at once, and now every node that joins the cluster automatically gets a persona and becomes a part of mesh and makes uh, the measurement to all other nodes. So this significantly uh, decreased the uh, amount of effort needed to manage this. But then uh, PRP realized that all this hardware can also be used for computations because it's not uh, well utilized just for uh, network measurements. And we started providing access to this hardware to scientists through Kubernetes and that just exploded. So it was super easy to join the cluster. Uh, we're using CI Logon, which is uh, open ID for a bunch of universities. So people can just log in with their university account and get access to the whole uh, set of hardware that PRP has plus uh, fast networks. And another great thing is that we can control what users see. It's, it's pretty much like in the cloud, users come and if they just need access to computing resources, they, it's virtualized. So they don't care where they're running, they don't care what node is that, they just get CPUs, memory, GPUs. Also, uh, we can provide access to network engineers and uh, uh, sysadmins and they can see actual hardware and they can see network e equipment through Kubernetes and they can uh, make all the tuning that they need. So that started in 2018 and late 18 and early 19 was the time of sprinkling those Fiona nodes around UC campuses. Uh, you can see John Graham on these pictures too, who is here. Um, and that was uh, increasing the number of nodes and uh, improving our uh, infrastructure. And that's when most Fiona aids were uh, delivered to a bunch of campuses. Uh, this is a slide of uh, storage nodes. Uh, so now we have uh, two petabytes in our main uh, Western Ceph pool. Uh, there is a half petabyte in Eastern pool and there are two more uh, local UCSD Ceph pools. So total, I guess it's close to three petabytes right now. And all this storage is available to scientists who work in uh, Nautilus cluster. Uh, some of it is reserved for labs and also for the uh, same for hardware, like some hardware is accessible by anyone in the cluster. Some hardware is dedicated to some projects, like people can bring some uh, nodes and say like when we need them, we reserve them for ourselves. When we don't need them, anyone can use it. Um, yeah, so here, um, also some uh, storage for HPRN cameras. Um, yeah. So this is a slide uh, showing how our GPU usage was growing. So we moved from uh, 100 GPUs uh, in, sometimes in 2019. Uh, oh yeah, this is from January 2019. 
and we went up to 400, uh, I think this is end of 19. So you see the four times growth and this is um, last quarter of 19 and this is a breakdown on the projects. So you can see a wide distribution of projects that are uh, computing on our infrastructure. And the red one, this huge line is Ice Cube. Uh, that's OSG and uh, that namespace is running. Um, it's kind of uh, on the on demand in the cloud. So, so this is uh, scavenging modes. Uh, they are only using GPUs that are not used by anybody else. So when somebody else is uh, requesting those GPUs, then their use is shrinking but they are still the biggest uh, consumer of GPUs in our cluster. And this is, I believe, this winter quarter. Yes, so we are hitting uh, 500 GPUs in our cluster. Uh, there is some slowdown in the middle, but um, we're still uh, increasing the uh, GPUs number. And again, there is a bunch of projects that are using GPUs. Um, some projects are CPU only and they are not represented here, but in total we have around 600 namespaces right now in the cluster working on different stuff. So our vision of the future, uh, our cluster is growing, but we cannot grow indefinitely and some projects are having different vision, but they still want to collaborate and the way we uh, move the cluster now is a federation of uh, clusters. And federation is a little bit different to the main vision of federation in Kubernetes project. Uh, we see it as a one level uh, federation of clusters as opposite to like one cluster controlling a bunch of others the way it is uh, mainstream now in Kubernetes. And we were happy to find the project called Admiralty because it allowed us to build this uh, one level federation of clusters. And currently we are testing it uh, by uh, federating, I think around five clusters now controlled by us. Uh, this is this big one, uh, Nautilus. Uh, another one is called NRP. So that's for uh, joining more of uh, regional networks and doing disk to disk uh, measurements. And a couple clusters with a special hardware. Uh, one of them is uh, aggregating IoT uh, devices. Uh, another one is Windows uh, Kubernetes cluster. So basically we can build a special Kubernetes clusters and then they can talk to each other and run jobs in each other, which is pretty hard to do in a single cluster. Uh, Ranger K3S is a great project to run uh, lightweight Kubernetes, so we use it for those IoT devices, Internet of Things. Uh, Cilium CNI, we are trying to uh, use now for networking federation so that clusters can see each other's uh, internal network if that's allowed. And Metal B allows us to expose uh, our resources to outside and again use from other clusters. Um, so that's also super convenient for federation. Uh, these are examples of IoT devices, uh, TPU board. Uh, John can talk about this uh, more. And um, so these are slides about comparing us to the cloud. Uh, like how do we, how are we better than cloud or how we can compete with cloud. So from February to June, 2020, um, equivalent in AWS was $1 million for uh, GPUs. And that includes uh, IceCube, OSG, and Folding at Home, and all the projects that are computing in our cluster. 
Um, so we have uh, 300 GPUs are bought by UCSD faculty, uh, 128 by Chase CI, and there are others. Um, so 77% is now from UCSD, but 33% um, from other universities. And the reason uh, this is much cheaper than uh, in the cloud is that faculty don't pay for equipment, uh, don't pay overhead on equipment don't pay for uh, space, power, and networking. It's provided by the campus. Uh, and also we use uh, gaming GPUs uh, instead of um, more expensive uh, ones uh, used in the cloud. So each Fiona 8 costs around uh, from 16 to 20,000 and those are good for three years. And if you add everything, it comes to around 80,000 for eight GPUs over three years. So um, in AWS, that would cost around 200,000 for three years. But again, uh, those Fiona 8s are not used 100% uh, all the time. And the advantage is that you bring a small number of Fiona nodes, but you can burst to the whole cluster when you need to. And because this bursting usually doesn't occur for different projects at the same time, uh, every project can benefit from uh, having a bunch of hardware. Uh, also, a good uh, point is that faculty cannot afford to, usually cannot afford to have their own sysadmin, especially if they have, bring like one or two Fiona nodes. And uh, the fact that the equipment they bring in the cluster is controlled uh, from like centralized uh, makes it much cheaper. So Kubernetes allows uh, like two sysadmins, me and John, to control that 160 nodes, and we can uh, grow more without big uh, big increase in the time we spend on it. So uh, can we com compete with them? Uh, yes, uh, if NFS continues. Uh, uh, supporting this hardware uh, purchases. Uh, if universities uh, keep paying for power, uh, rec space and networking. And if we, uh, like our uh, vision of it is that um, long term researchers, like those big groups that use a bunch of our, our resources uh, can start paying for uh, sysadmin time and for supporting uh, their infrastructure. And again, uh, clouds don't provide user support. We do uh, a lot of uh, science outreach. We do provide support for our users, uh, tell them how to, run, how to adapt their workflows to Kubernetes, uh, do stuff like that. Uh, and you, so with all this, we are winning three to one, but again, this might change in the future. Thank you, and questions, please. So I see a question in the chat. How are your sysadmin and other rights established? Are you a recharge unit? Uh, right now, my salary and John's are paid from uh, PRP grants, grants, but PRP is finishing this year. And uh, in the future, we are, I think there are plans to recharge, but it's uh, not clear right now. And Jason is saying amazing. And could you illustrate with some researcher examples of what research has been enabled and accelerated with this work? Sure, I can uh, share. Hello. 
I'm sorry. Uh, someone just had an open mic. We muted him. Uh, so this is a Pacific Research Platform portal, and here's a list of uh, namespace. This is just like biggest namespaces that provided information about them. And uh, if you go to Nautilus Optiputer Net, uh, and there is a namespaces over overview page. And here uh, is a list of 600 namespaces and most of them have some descriptions. And yeah, so if you're interested, you can read about all of them. And so those are people who actually got some useful results. They published papers and uh, they are act actively uh, computing in our cluster. Do you have a favorite you'd like to highlight? If not, no pressure. Seems uh, like a lot of cool stuff. As you said, biggest one is OSG. Uh, so that's high energy physics, and they are uh, running C CMS and LIGO are running big computations in ours. Uh, Brain engineers. Uh, this is from UCSC. Uh, that's a big one. Uh, so they're doing machine learning. Um, John, do you have any? To highlight well I, I like the uh, the remote desktop stuff that we're working on for virtualizing uh, OpenGL applications like Unreal Engine and Houdini maybe I can spin one up real quick and I'll show you Yeah, this uh, Text PRP from Clemson is, um, so they're running Kubeflow, and those guys are running like hundreds of pods at a time. So that's pretty big. This is a Wi-Fi simulation from UCSD and CMIR. Uh, th th these are guys who made this map. Um, yeah, and there's Wi-Fi as well. So, Dima, uh, why don't you let me share the desk, my desktop, and I'll I'll show them. Amy, could you enable John? Yep. Okay, we're good. Okay, here we go. So this is um, Houdini running in a web browser. Uh, I, can, I think I can prove that. There we go, a web browser. And uh, it's got full OpenGL ver um, support. It's got a 2080 Ti uh, running uh, on a node, I think in San Diego, but uh, We've actually run this on machines in, in Korea with the added latency, but it still works quite nice. And I can run the animation at 24 frames a second. This is a 300 by 300 uh, uh, smoke simulation running on CPUs in real time. And this is all remote. And so we can also at the same time, we could have Blender running and uh, be playing around in here. Uh, we also have containerized um, um, Metasphere or Metashape uh, for doing structure from motion. So all those uh, GL apps that you really needed a desktop to do, now you can do in a web browser. But it's all running in a cluster and uh, this, this particular instance, I think it's got 64 gig of RAM, a 2080 Ti, um, a bunch of ephemeral storage, and um, yeah. Oh, I think 16 cores assigned to it. So those, those um, remote desktop applications are gonna be coming more and more popular 
actually uh, UV Panda from Berkeley uh, created this uh, Jupyter desktop not too long ago that uh, we're really excited about uh, having a, a remote desktop available in your Jupyter notebook. Just adds, uh, you know, everybody's going virtual now, so we got to have all those tools that we used to have on our desktops in the cloud, and then we have might as well put all our data there too. John, thank you for showing that. That is really awesome. And it's all open source. Cool. So um, we have a question from Chris Hoffman. And that's a great point that you need support and research engagement, regardless of whether hosting on cloud or on-prem. Could you talk about uh, how you use Rocket Chat to build community? Is it basically like Slack? Yes, uh, Rocket Chat is our alternative to Slack, which we don't pay for and which we fully control. And uh, we are run, now working on chatbots that will uh, look at all our messages and build some knowledge base that will allow us to like automatically reply to users for some frequently asked questions. And uh, we, we've built a pretty big community now in our Rocket Chat. So, now we have more than thousand users, I think, in Rocket Chat, and like couple, probably like fifty of them are online all the time. I'm online twenty four seven, pretty much. I have it on my phone, and users ping me uh, any time of the day and night. Um, and uh, what we are really happy to see is that now people start uh, helping other people. So if somebody is dropping a question and I'm not online, then somebody else can answer and they are sharing like their experience and best practices and stuff like that. And there is a bunch of channels for like special interest groups. So people like, for example, Kubeflow or some like network admins for open NSA or stuff like that. So those people communicate in their own uh, channels. Um, so yeah, that's the primary way to contact us and with me. So this is the URL. We're really excited about the chat ops uh, potential integrating um, the cluster with the chat. Uh, so you can uh, be identify yourself to the, the bot and then have it do things in the cluster on your behalf that would normally take an admin just to understand the syntax of. And how many messages do we have in our chat now? Like 300,000? Yeah, it's getting close to me that I don't remember. But also we're getting a bunch of uh, monitoring stuff in the same rocket chat. So all our demons that are watching the class are sending messages if something is wrong. And so yeah, our cluster is open for all uh, NSF funded researchers. Uh, anyone here can join, get their namespace. Um, uh, we also have a Jupyter notebook server if you just want to play around and check out UV Panda's Jupyter desktop. Also posted in the chat. So yeah, that's the lightweight version. You don't uh, get your hands dirty with Kubernetes, but you can still run some pods in our cluster, get some GPUs and run stuff. And I, I rebuilt, so there is a project called Jupyter's uh, Docker Stack, I think. Uh, they are building a stack of Jupyter images for different purposes, but they are not uh, doing, building them with CUDA support. So our Jupyter is using same images, but with CUDA support. Any more questions for Dimitri and John? Thanks for all these great links.
Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so very much for a great presentation and discussion. Really cool work. Okay, so I will um, wrap us up here. I want to thank the speakers, the attendees, and the planners. And um, should be on your calendars, but the next meetup is on Tuesday, September 22nd. Um, we are confirming some speakers who we hope will talk about virtual reality in the cloud. Um, and we'll have our, another Skydeck speaker, of course. And I also included a link here in case you would like to suggest a speaker. So if you go to cto.berkeley.edu slash cloud, um, there's information about the cloud community and strategy and um, within there, there's a page on the meetup and you can suggest a speaker there. So please do.